Welcome back to the official podcast for the HBO original, The Penguin. I'm your host, film critic Amy Nicholson. After each show episode, the creators, writers, directors, cast, and crew are braving our studio so we can ask them about the cruelties we have just enjoyed. There will be spoilers. And isn't that why we're all here? Hold on to your straitjackets because episode four is the Arkham Asylum episode, and it's intense. Let's think of it as the origin story of Sophia Falcone, our main antagonist, depending on who you're rooting for. For years, we've known that Batman sends his lunatic opponents to live in Arkham, a jail for the criminally insane. To Batman, it's a kindness. His victims get to stay alive. But now, we're given the nightmare of what Arkham is actually like. And worse, to be there and be innocent. Maybe somewhere in this hospital, there are hardworking, compassionate doctors who want to make their patients better, but that's not who we meet. In fact, we find that Sophia was never insane, at least not before going to Arkham. Ten years of trauma later, well, we have an episode ending that makes us feel inside out. First up, we are going to be speaking with our writer and supervising producer, John McCutcheon, and our editor, Meg Redeker. Hello, you two. Congratulations on a very brutal episode. Hi, <laughs> thank you. Thank you. So you two were interested to give us new insight into Sophia, to, to empathize with Sophia, I would say in this episode, it even began thinking of her as a victim, and then Sophia kills her entire family. So for each of you, what was your favorite scene to work on? I'll start with you, Meg. I mean, obviously, and editorially, the Arkham stuff is amazing. Um, and I would definitely go there. But then I would also say, when she realizes that she's going to jail and she's in the police station, I mean, you just see this innocence being lost and her reality coming to, coming, coming to her. Oh, yeah, that scene. Let's actually listen to a little bit of that. So I, uh, I do an evaluation and I um, answer a few questions to prove I'm sane, right? And that's it, right? Then what? I'm afraid it's not that simple. The judge agreed to the ADA's request. You're being remanded to Arkham State Hospital for observation. No. <laughs> no, that doesn't make any sense. You'll be under their care till the start of trial. When is that? Six months from now. Oh my God, I'm no, I'm not doing that. I am not doing that. Can't you stop this? You're my, you're my fucking lawyer. I'm sorry. I'll give you two minutes. He is punishing me for something he did. You don't know that. Alberto, wake up, are you kidding me? He strangled those women and then he strangled that reporter and strung her up to pin it on me. He did the same thing to mom. It's true, and I'm not gonna make it. I'm not gonna make it in a place like that. I'm gonna die in there. I'm gonna die in there, and he knows it. He knows it. That's what he wants. Stop. Well, let's drill into that scene. Yeah. Let, let's start with the writer's room. What did you want out of that police station scene? Yeah, I think it's it's sort of the realization for Sophia that like she's she's totally fucked here, and there's a couple of lines where she's like, "Wake up, Alberto." that she's just desperate for someone to believe her, to take her seriously, and she's right. And it's her asserting herself really for the first time of like, this is the truth, this is what's happening. I need you, the only person in my life that is like my support system to just confirm that. And the fact that he can't is so heartbreaking. And then as she's pleading, like, I'll never make it in there. I'm going to die in a place like that. And, like, that's what he wants. And the full heartbreak of, like, that's her losing her father. That's her losing her family, everything. It's it's so crushing. And, yeah, it's just really in her performance that you see her completely fall apart emotionally at that point. Of, like, she's lost everything she loves. And then you strip everything away from her in Arkham and you totally beat her up. But like, this is, this is the point where she fails. And it's, I think it's even harder for her. Wow. I mean, in an episode with so many big points, her first murder, her first lot, like the loneliness you're describing actually is really hitting me. Yeah. It's, it's so painful. <laughs> that, that scene for me is maybe the hardest to watch in the episode because it just, it's gut wrenching. Like, it it was very challenging to write. We went back and forth a lot about what that scene was. Um, but I don't, this, I just didn't expect w what Kristen delivered in that scene 
was yeah. so incredible. Her performance is spectacular. So true. In that moment. I mean, it gave me goosebumps when I first saw it. And I was like, wow, she transforms like, you know, a fine scene into something absolutely beautiful and heartbreaking and just raw in that moment that, you know, sometimes you just don't expect these things, but she just nailed it. Well, Meg, let's really get into what seems like one of the big challenges of this episode, which is flashbacks. On top of that, nesting flashbacks, flashbacks within a flashback, within a flashback. Sure. How on earth are you making sure that the audience knows what is happening when? Yeah, I mean, obviously that was, I think between the flashbacks and the, you know, the electrocution or whatever you want to call it, the those scenes, those montages that you point out, um, there really are sort of something that we were refining and refining and refining and refining. And you're like sort of little by little giving people little information about the storyline, like her memory coming back, you know? And so we, we, you know, we would, we play with like, how much, what are we revealing here? What do we, and we, we'd go through many different, you know, variations of, you know, the this, this story or telling the story of the edit and revealing a little bit at a time and a little bit at a time. And, you know, whether we added this music, working with music, working with VO. So I think that was one of the things that you're just constantly refining as you're moving through the edit. You know, obviously you have the script to base it on, which, you know, is a great blueprint, but then in the edit, in terms of the rhythms and in terms of, you know, what is, I mean, we were constantly refining it. Like, for example, both of the, you know, when she is getting the electrocute being, I don't know, are we calling it electrocution or what is it that we refer to that as? I don't know. Um, but she is definitely, in terms of how much we show the repetition of those images, um, you know, what she's experiencing in terms of the memory of her mother uh, hanging, you know, that was just something that we were constantly refining. So, yeah. Yeah, I mean, let's really talk about those two ARCA mon montages because they both seem to say different things about her time there. You you seem to be going after two different parts. You know, this yeah. first one, when she's received at Arkham, she has her body prodded and scrubbed. That really felt like it was about losing sense of yourself as a person. And then the one that we're talking about now, the six months of being electrocuted, that yeah. one I really felt you channeling us feeling her lose a sense of time. Definitely, definitely. And I, and I think, well, just the first montage, I just want to say, when I first got that footage, I was like, oh, my God, all these tight shots. And yet they were just so brutal. And ultimately, I was like, wow, we got to really play into that brutal, the, the brutality of that intake. And it's funny because it's one of those uh, edits that I worked on you know, during the editor's cut, and it didn't change that much afterwards. I mean, maybe slightly, but it really what remained the same. And I just knew that there was something raw about what Helen had shot and the, the footage. And it's sort of like, you just felt it and you had to feel it as this woman is being brutalized during this intake, which I just love. Um, but as far as the other montage, you know, that was really interesting too, because you're right, you're, she's losing herself and she's going through these hallucinations. She's losing time, but also us as a viewer, we're seeing the passage of time on some level. You know, that's representing the passage of time, which helps us to, to sort of give us the time that Sophia has spent at Arca. And I think the first one is really, you know, losing your body and like your body doesn't belong to you anymore and how terrifying and horrific that is. But then what's worse than that is like, your mind doesn't even belong to you. Like we're taking your mind to and everything that you feel about yourself and that your identity is, is gone to. I mean, these scenes were so hard to watch. I can't imagine how it felt to write them. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, not great. <laughs> um, but yeah, you just want to... You, you want to be honest to the story and truthful to the character and not hold any punches you know it's like this is this is what she went through and it's terrible and you want to present it in a truthful respectful way but you know you're not trying to sugarcoat anything here like how does someone come out the other side the way Sophia does um it's not all it's not all roses well yeah and I mean you know two decades ago when Christopher Nolan did his first Batman movie everybody was really excited about the idea of a comic book character with trauma but now, you know, two decades later, it feels like trauma is kind of on the edge of being overused. I would say and in part because a lot of people have done it clumsily. So 
how did you approach it? I don't know if I have a great answer for the approach. It was really just sort of putting the pieces together, I think. This was because this this episode was really just like a structural puzzle in a lot of ways, too, of you know, we have the relationship with Alberto and we have the relationship with her father, and then she has this whole Arkham story, and uh, we have the bliss angle that we have to put in there, too. So it was like arranging the pieces, but also building the narrative arc. Um, and it was just, a lot of it was like, okay, we know where she ends. You know, you have the first three episodes to see, first three episodes to see how she comes out the other side, but like, what is the black box we're not seeing? How does... How does someone emerge from Arkham that way that didn't go in? Um, so I think it was just unearthing what could be those traumatic events that form a person like Sophia Falcone. I mean, are you a flashcards guy moving pieces of the puzzle around? Like, what are you looking at as you're figuring out how to put this together? Oh, yeah. I mean, in the writer's room, we have note cards, we have sticky cards, we have magnetic dry erase boards. I mean, everything is just like, you know, one of those like red line serial killer. (laughs) (laughs) Apropos. Yeah. Um, It sort of felt like we were all in Arkham at times, just trying to process and get through it and make make sense of it. (laughs) I mean, and also you're writing these lines of verbal manipulation that I thought were really interesting in here. You know, from hearing Dr. Rush referring to Sophia getting attacked in the cafeteria as an incident to this big moment right here. You had scratches on on your hands the day mom died. But I know that I... I know they weren't from her. You know, I I know that I... I, um, They were from... Something else. I, I don't know what, but something. Right. My sweet Sophia. What's happened to you? You're clearly not yourself. You're confused, uh, sick. I think you need to leave before you make a scene. Tell me about writing for the language of abuse, of, of abusers, of people twisting words around. I mean, you seem like a nice guy to me, so what are you drawing on? Um, I mean... I, I, maybe to your point earlier of like the theme of gaslighting is just sort of extremely present uh, culturally. I don't know, just not being believed, I think, is sort of what resonated with me of this character of like, she can't trust anybody and no one is telling her the truth. No, I I, I think that's a really, uh, this notion of not being I don't know, one of your questions being that, you know, how does this relate to you or how does Sophia relate to you? And I think she really does relate to me because as being a woman trying to be heard, you know what I mean? And 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 sort of like this archetypal story of a woman that's put in, into an institution or being institutionalized, it really sort of really shows it from her point of view. And ultimately we come out of Arkham like just wanting to be, you know, we're with her, we're rooting for her and just wanting to, you know, see what she's going to do next, even though she's coming out in this sort of uh, brutalized sort of, I don't know, I don't want to say she's a monster at that point, but maybe she is, you know, we don't know what she's going to be, you know? I mean, to that point, like this world is so twisted in this episode that when Sophia speaks facts, you know, my dad framed me for murder, other people react to her like she's insane. I mean, do you think that her extended family, especially her female cousin, are they bad or are they just brainwashed? I think they're in a system that they can't fight back against. Um, I don't know if it's brainwashing so much as it's like, well, I'm just powerless, right? It's this like learned helplessness of I can't fight the bad guy. 
So, like, it's not my fault that you're in this position. It's really his. And yes, I'm a part of the system, but like, what was I supposed to do? There's like a little bit of a fascist mentality underpinning that. Um, but there are there would be consequences if they went against Carmine. Like, they would end up in the same place Sophia is. So they know what this this bargain they're making is up front. It's like you either go along and tow the company line or your life is over too. So, you know, when that's the choice you're facing, like as awful as it is, you sort of understand where her family is coming from. Well, and Meg, you have to cut around that family table. Show us their faces. Sure. I, 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 I kind of don't let them off the hook in a weird way because I feel like they're, 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 you know, these are kind of, in a weird way, kind of twisted people in a twisted family, you know? Well, yeah, and in episode two, we saw these scratches on Sophia's neck. And I remember thinking in that episode, oh, it must be this self-inflicted reminder of wearing that heavy Arkham neck collar. But yeah. the way your editing kind of put things together for me in this episode, I also was thinking, oh, her mother's noose. Right, right. That's all that's all interrelated. And I have to say, it's, you know, it's the neck collar, it's her scratching herself, it's the noose. And what's really interesting is that the, you know, obviously makeup did some stuff with that. And, but also the visual effects, you know, led by uh, Johnny Han. I mean, they literally had this timeline so that every scene in terms of the visual effects to make sure that the, it was correct, you know, the scratches or where her neck was at, they were keeping that track of that, which is pretty amazing. I mean, I have to say uh, they did an amazing job with the visual effects in a big way. Yeah. Yeah. We always, or I don't know, we've always conceived of Sophia as someone who can't really breathe. Um, so a lot of these things are thematic of, yeah, the scratching around the neck, the noose of being strangled, the fact that she's the only character on our show that smokes. Um, and it's, she's voiceless for a lot of this. So it's sort of a process of her finding her voice where she wasn't allowed to speak. She had to be this person for her father. Um, and then she was put away and she didn't have a voice and she doesn't know who she is. So coming out, it's like she does still feel strangled by this world and she's just trying to sort of embody herself through through her voice and and breath, really. I want to bring in Oz here, too, because we get these glimpses of what her relationship was like with Oz in the past. I mean, tell me about their power dynamic back in the day. I'll start with you, John. Uh, yeah, I mean, she's a spoiled little rich girl who's driven around by this guy that, you know, her dad found for her. And they've formed this kind of like scrappy underdog um, friendship that's, you know, in, served them both well up until this point. Um because they're both in the shadow of Carmine and the Falcone family. They're both feeling sort of put upon, put upon or marginalized. Um, and it's, you know, it's sort of a beautiful friendship in that way. We're, like, hopefully rooting for them and for the tragedy to be like, oh, they were kind of doomed from the get. Uh, but they, yeah, to see her kind of put him in his place was fun. And that was fun to write and think about. Yeah, those little bits, like... What are you doing inside? Like he's a dog. Yeah. 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 And also the line when he when he says something like, you know, after she speaks to the reporter and and Oz says to her, you know, maybe that's not a good idea. You know, and, and she says, I don't care what you think. I mean, that just that just pains him to no end. And it's just like at that point too, when when they're when they're it doesn't align, like her needs and his needs don't align. He's ready to throw her out the window at any second. You know what I mean? And it's always about Oz on some level. And it's at that moment that you sort of realize that he's he's sort of put in the situation. Well, he's not put in the situation that he's looking out for number one, you know, at all times. And I think it's like, if you've ever worked for someone who's kind of really wealthy in a way, and you're like, oh, we're, we're kind of friends and like, I, we can kind of kiki and like have a good time. And then you, you take it like a little step too far. You become a little bit too familiar or comfortable. And they're like, no, you're my employee. And you're like, oh, that's right. It's always capitalism at the end of the day. Has that happened to you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, oh, I thought we were. Oh, no. OK, I misread our relationship. I thought we were friends. And no. I'm just a peon. Before we go, I want to ask you both, is there a favorite just microbeat in this episode? A little look, a little line delivery that you're just 
really proud of. It's still kind of sticking with you. Oh, my God. There's just so many moments of Kristen that I was just fully blown away by. I just, I really love the scene, I have to say, that Helen shot with her and Alberto in that car where she's trying to suss out what Alberto knows um, and just trying to get some validation. And that he's, he's, they're toying with each other, the brother and sister, so it's a little light, but there's something really heavy underneath it. And I, for some reason, I just love that scene so much. Their delivery is amazing, the way Helen shot it with the like really high overhead angle. Um, makes it feel super private and just the two of them. But then Oz is, you still feel Oz there lingering and him looking back through that mirror is so menacing. Uh, and I just like that, that dynamic of the three of them in that moment feels so loaded and powerful to me that that's, I mean, that was always my takeaway. I'm like, I don't know why, but this scene is like just gripping me. Yeah. I have to say the scene for me is, um, you know, when she kills Magpie <laughs> and ultimately, you know, little by little, she's getting more and more annoyed by her. And then she said, did you talk to the doctor? Did you tell him about me? Were you spying on me? And then she just kills her in this most brutal, disgusting manner. And then it's the line, I'm innocent at the end. I told you I was innocent. And she's got blood all over it. <laughs> you know, she just killed this person. And it's just like, I don't know, that scene for me is just like, wow. Yeah, yeah, it's amazing. Oh, well, congrats on giving everybody the shivers this week. Well done, John. Well done, Meg. Thank you thank both you. for coming in. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Next up, we have series creator, executive producer, and showrunner Lauren LaFranc returning along with our Sophia Falcone. I am so glad to have you both here for this big Sophia episode. Hi. Hello. Hello. It's so nice to be here. <laughs> well, so... Sophia Falcone has existed in the Batman comic since the 90s. You know, people who know their Batman lore, they expect Sophia to be a serial killer. Lauren, you introduce her in the show as a serial killer. I believed you in the first three episodes that she was a serial killer. You seem to be having a lot of fun using this character to toy with the audience. Um, uh, well, <laughs> I guess so. Yes. I mean, I think for me, part of what I wanted to do with Sophia is to kind of I guess, speak about what happens to women a lot, which is they easily get labeled. And obviously, of course, if you're coming from Arkham State Hospital in our show, in our world, you're going to presume that that person is uh, mentally unwell. Um, and so I wanted to just do a play on that a little bit of especially these men calling her crazy and a lot of people whispering about her and how uncomfortable that might feel. And I wanted the audience, honestly, to engage in that as well, so that when you realize the truth of what she's experienced, you might feel more empathy and realize that maybe we shouldn't label women in that way, or we should be asking deeper questions, at least without presuming as much. Though, again, understandable, she's going from Markham State Hospital, and, she, and so there is something up with Sophia that is very complicated. Um, she's definitely not the woman she started out as. Well, Kristen, what sold you on wanting to play her? Uh, that they wanted me to. <laughs> <laughs> like, yeah. I mean, everything. Like, you know, I have been... Um, it's, it's like a, it's a couple different parts. I am a huge Batman fan and have always wanted to be in the films or anything. Like I, I, I grew up, the, the Tim Burton films were deeply seminal for me. I've seen Batman forever a thousand times in theaters, like forced my father to take me. And, you know, I've always loved that universe. And so there was just that sort of like childhood wish fulfillment, um, deep, profound uh, dream element to it. And then just this character is, you know, what Lauren created is so beautiful and complex and also fun and also uh like an a cornucopia of things to play and those don't come around all the time you know and so i was like beside myself that i um was getting to do that and i've been like you know wishing and hoping to play something like that to get the opportunity to play something like that so i was i was there i didn't like need any convincing at all <laughs> i was just like really thrilled <laughs> Well, yeah, yeah, I mean, because my first impressions of you as an actress, you know, the first things I got to see you in were these dark comedies, you know, where like yeah. dark and comedy were pretty equal. And I was curious, you know, here, 
What would you say your proportion of dark to comedy is? And honestly, does having a sense of humor help you excess darkness? Whoa. Um, I think that there's, I mean, I like that there's humor in here because I think that's one of the, I think the show does have a lot of humor. <laughs> I guess that's like all in the eye of the beholder. <laughs> but there were like so many moments when I laughed out loud. Like I was telling Lauren, like when I, I just saw the first four somewhat recently and like, there's the part where Oz is sitting with Vic and he's like, don't get your little hands. I, I, Lauren, I always screw it up, but it's like, you, you want me to eat it with your, your little hands have been all over the pickle? Like, <laughs> like I think that's so funny. Um, and like, I I think that's also one of the reasons I l- have always been drawn to Batman because I always found that there is like humor in uh, like in the Tim Burton films. There's humor. Like they're, they're, they're always like, there's always this element of like, yes, it's dark and gritty, but there's also... Um, humor and a little bit of camp depending on like which one you're working with um so I and I also just that is the type that of stuff that I like to be a part of and also watch because I think like life kind of strikes me as that as like a balance between the two you know I don't know but I don't as far as your last question I don't know and and like it does like humor help me access it but um yeah, I think like life is a balance of it's like a tragic comedy. So it makes sense to me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, your joke in this episode about Luca getting his third wife from Portugal.com. I, oh, yeah. I snorted. I definitely oh, snorted in an unflattering way. <laughs> good, good, good. That's a that's a Kristen improv. It is? It was. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that that was. That was trying to make um Alexa laugh. <laughs> I just felt like she's so lovely and I felt this immediate warmth and it was like very one of my favorite scenes to film is actually when they see each other at the funeral for the first time and um there was just something about her like I I I just found her to be so lovely and she's very funny and um I think maybe because it was like one of the few times you also get to see Sophia both in the flashbacks and in present day with someone who um you know, what once meant a lot to her, uh, it was like fun to lean into. And so I think I was just trying to make her giggle. <laughs> and like we were just and I think also we were like in our little party dresses and, you know, you like have been filming all day and you're getting like a little like, woo. Um, so, yeah. Well, I was actually really curious about something that you're touching on, you know, that I mean, Lauren, you're writing in this episode pre Arkham Sophia and post Arkham Sophia. Did you start with one over the other? How do you think of these two Sophias? Um, well, I knew her backstory. You know, like it's hard for me to write a character without feeling like I know where they come from. And and I've said this before, but really a lot of my inspiration for Sophia or why I wanted her to come out of Arkham State Hospital is because of Rosemary Kennedy, because I just felt like there is something about coming from a very um, patriarchal family and a very well-known wealthy family that sometimes can stifle people or, or start to put them in a box. And so uh, to me, I just thought Rosemary Kennedy is such a tragic, fascinating figure because, you know, she's put in a mental institution by her father and she got a lobotomy and we don't know her story. And so her story is never told. And so that deeply informed sort of my desire to want to tell a story in that vein, in our own version of that, in our world, um, with Sophia. So in that regard, I felt like I needed to know that Sophia was, you know, more spoiled, uh, came from privilege. We were trying to also tell like a wealth and class disparity story in a lot of ways. And so I wanted to examine a young woman in a family like this, who obviously comes from the mob. So that breeds its own complication, but, um, but that she is used to having a certain amount of things given to her. And then what happens to a woman like that, who already has darker elements, I think, inside of her because she knows what her father does. And she's, you know, been raised with the mob world and that her mother died when she was young. So there's a lot of stuff already inside of her. Um, So that's who I knew existed to me, at least when I wrote the first episode with Sophia. And I knew the things I wanted to sort of tease and, especially in her conversation with Oz at lunch in the first episode, for instance. Um, but obviously then Kristen walked in and brought Sophia to life in such an incredible way that it was that was very inspiring to me um, to just make sure we're deepening her as much as possible and we give Kristen, you know, hopefully the best material that we possibly can. 
I mean, when you when Kristen walked in, let's talk about that moment. And you've really pictured your Sophia. What did that do? Did it activate new things in your brain about who this character was? Yeah, I mean, it's, you know, I've always said it's like when you're writing something, I mean, literally, it feels flat, right? I mean, it's like paper's flat. It's a really smart thing to say, by the way. <laughs> oh, God. Um, anyway, but truly, but, you know, it, you have these ideas in your head. It starts as a very personal thing. And I'm just by myself, you know, writing the first episode. Then I had the amazing team of writers and John McCutcheon was like incredible in, in this episode. Um, yeah, like I love his weird twisted mind. Um, but, uh, you know, in starting to think about a character like Sophia, I didn't picture anybody. You know, I just pictured Sophia or I heard Sophia in my head. Um, but then when Kristen came um, in and just read her and was her, you know, I was in a weird closet um, <laughs> space <laughs> with uh, yeah. <laughs> Dylan Clark. We, brought, we flew Kristen in to just do a chemistry read with Colin, even mm -hmm. though we knew we really loved Kristen and her talent already, but we just wanted to just make sure that they vibed. And it was in a strange conference room and I was in a foot in a closet. Uh, with, <laughs> Why with were you in a closet? I don't know because there was the there was, space was awful. It was very small, and and no one want like the last thing we wanted is for Kristen and Colin to like see any of us, and be distracted by that because that's not really what it should be. So yeah. um, we found a closet, and uh, and I was in there with mo a monitor and headphones, and I don't know. It was really it made me smile. Like the scene that I had played in my head privately again and again, um, how twisted and dark and um, energetic and funny Kristen was, was really, really exciting. Um, so yeah. Thanks Lauren. Yeah, you're, welcome, <laughs> you're welcome, Kristen. <laughs> Worth being put in the closet. Um, yeah, let's really get into episode four that we all just saw. I mean, in this episode, yeah, we're jumping back. We're meeting Sophia as this nice, innocent mafia daughter, I guess as nice and innocent as a mafia daughter could be. Then we're watching her get broken so we really understand why this pretty good girl rebuilt herself into someone scary. So, Kristen, what is your process for playing all of these Sophias, for just getting into their headspaces on the set? I mean, some of that is like stuff I'm sort of like precious about, like that I don't I, 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 I weirdly don't like hearing how actors do things because I'm like, where's the magic? Like, <laughs> like, don't tell me about it. <laughs> but like, uh, I would say that, you know, um, the, the writing is so brilliant that so much of it was so clear. And then our director for this episode, Helen Shaver, is so incredible. I can't sing her praises enough. And I just felt very much like in lockstep with her, in lockstep with Lauren, like I felt like, um, you know, I, I, I figured out like kind of what I wanted to do with some things in the way to like modulate, you know, the where she is at certain times and, and, you know, try and show who she is before all this happens and, and really show how she's driven mad. And, you know, um, but yeah, it felt like um, this was such, such a testament to Helen who made those the, the days on that episode feel like we were like in the trenches together or something, you know, like it was a really um, very fast schedule and we had to shoot a lot in a little bit of time. And she just was like, dive in. You can do this. She empowered me. She empowered all of like the background artists in Arkham. I'd never seen this before. Like she before we started filming that day and all the, the mess hall scenes, um, she took time to be like, I want everyone here to come up with a character and really think about who you are in here because I'm just going to let the cameras roll and like Sophia's going to walk through. And I I've talked about it a lot in the last couple of days and and I still get like chills because it felt like I was in a play. It was like a, it was like being immersed and it and that's so rare to have someone who cares and who cares about like every single element of it and who empowers actors that much. And so like that was like a huge part of the process too that felt like we were sort of all in this together um yeah i mean it was just uh so yeah and then you know like i have like my like playlists and other stuff that i do but <laughs> you're secretively i mean i'm trying to even <laughs> picture what it would be like like walking into a scary cafeteria is has been my nightmare since i was a kid oh of course being an actor <laughs> walking school. into a cafeteria where like everybody has yeah. a set personality that's wow yeah. And it was, but it was thrilling, you know, and it was like so 
you know, like one of my favorite moments of that episode and also of the series, it was a moment that I was so terrified of messing up is when she kills Magpie. And I, you know, when you're in that space with everyone and they all like know what's happening and I'm like, you know, going through this like really intense thing and, um, and they're all like the, the the cacophony that was around me, all these women who like had these characters who were like screaming and banging on tables. I mean, you, I still I just still get chills. It was like incredible. And and um, yeah, that's a testament to Helen. Yeah, no. I, and also like the fact that like to Kristen's point, the fact that the background artists, re- I mean, they brought it. They brought they it. Brought so it. it was so amazingly. It, yeah. Because they that got could in have my gone face. so they were horribly wrong. They got totally. Yeah. <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, like it was so. You know, like she had them like walking up and like looking at me. Like it was so, and we were all so focused together. You know, those are like long periods of time to remain that focused when it's like dark <laughs> stuff. So like it also just felt like you know I felt partnered with them. Like we were all just so locked in. Um, and yeah, it was, it was incredible. Well, I mean, Lauren, like the things that happened to Sophia in this episode, I found them hard to watch. So were they hard to write? Yeah. I mean, you know, again, like John McCutcheon, uh, wrote this episode and obviously like, I'm my role is to do what I want to do to a script as well. But like John really, he, as I said before, he's like got an incredibly twisted, mind and that's why I love him and have been friends with him for a long time because I do too. Um, I mean, I it was really important to me that you empathize with Sophia and that we don't put her through something in a gratuitous way. I mean, I hope it doesn't feel gratuitous. It feel it should feel shocking and terrible because it was terrible what she went through. And it and you know it's very challenging to figure out we have such a short period of time to tell a story like this in terms of just the scope of one single episode of television. And so that montage was very key, for instance, in terms of taking us through time and having you experience something with her and and trying to make sure that the tonal balance was right. But um, it felt relevant and it felt important to put her through that, not to just do it to do it, but instead to have you understand the type of thing that Sophia went through um, that it's emotionally violent and it's very traumatic for her. Um, So even though it is very hard to watch, uh, you know, for me as a storyteller, my goal is to, I want you to feel things, you know, when you watch something Um, and it helps so much when you have Kristen doing all of it, because I think she really grounds it and makes it very relatable. Um, And that's truly what makes it so terrible is you care about Sophia. Um, If you didn't care about her, it, it would not be as impactful. Yeah. I mean, on that note, there's a moment in this episode that I actually want us to listen to. It's, you know, where Sophia is out. She's at the table with her family. She's listing the murder victims of the hangman. And almost under her breath, she refers to herself as a victim, too. And in that moment, I realized I was caught off guard in a good way, that it felt rare to see someone so strong also be able to embrace that word. Let's listen to that. As you all know, I was stuffed in Arkham State Hospital for a decade, convicted of murdering seven women. Summer Gleason, Taylor Montgomery, Yolanda Jones, Nancy Hoffman, Susanna Weekly, DeVry Blake, and Trisha Becker. Their names are worth saying. Victims are so quickly forgotten aren't they? Our stories are rarely told. Okay. All right. I mean, Kristen, that moment caught me off guard in a good way. Like, it felt rare to see someone as strong as this character embrace that word. Yeah. I mean, I think that's what's so brilliant about that entire scene. That was another scene that um, is, is like, maybe one of my favorites of the whole show that I got to do. I remember reading that scene and, and being just blown away and I think that moment and actually the moment that always really moved me was that she says I loved you like I like what like you know that that like heartbreak of like I I got punished and I loved you and I I didn't do anything wrong other than just love my family like it, it just there's so many different layers to it and that yes she's like finally 
uh, I mean, there's, there's, yeah, there's so many different things going on in that speech. And certainly that moment where she says, like, our stories are so rarely told. Um, yeah, it's, they're never going to acknowledge it in any way. And so she has to do it for herself before she kills them. <laughs> I think the, the thing that's so important to me about that scene in so many ways is like we trying to build in all these different elements like the way she walks in she's in this dress and based on her scene prior with Dr. Rush it's like we don't know what she's her intent is we know she's supposed to go to Italy and then when she sits down like to me the like I love detail so much so it made me happy always the idea that like I'm like I want Sophia to pour the the wine fully to the brim, mm -hmm. you know, and like and the meatball and in the makes, mouth and yeah. the meatball. I like always love that moment. Those that was, details yeah. are so essential and Kristen pulls them off and manages to achieve something in that, that still feels grounded, which, you know, on the page that could go, <laughs> it could go either <laughs> way. Um, and cause it's always supposed to be like a little elevated or not, but then, um, then Kristen's speech is so incredible. And, you know, for me, when we're in an editing, we, it's no music is on it. We're just like watching her and it's a long speech and it's because she's so engaging and, and so incredible in it. And the fact that she's naming all these different women um, is so also so important because her father killed these women and they, he chose women that were sex workers or women who were maybe new to Gotham. I mean, things, details that I know that maybe weren't fully able to be out there, but that like those women like as as Sophia says, like often don't ever that no one talks about them. People just stop talking about them. Um, so her giving voice to them felt very important as she's giving voice to herself and her own situation and wants her family to like look at her and really see her in that moment. And when she has that line, I'm not the one who's sick. The world is. I mean, to what degree do you two think that that's true? Uh, I mean, I think it's both. Because I think, I think, she, I'm, I obviously am on Sophia's side. The world is sick. The world is like, what did this to her? And also, she is, like, sick from it. Like, that's what's horrible about this. It's like this never-ending cycle. But I think her, her saying that in that moment, you know, she didn't ask for any of this. And that is part of why the world is so sick. Um, because, it, like... <sighs> No one deserves something like that, like what she goes through. And um, yeah, it's been uh, and yet there's like a weird ownership. And that's what I love about that juxtaposition, too, of saying that and believing that is she's also about to step into like this power that is like does involve mass murder. <laughs> like, so you're like, <laughs> you know, like so you're you're which is also why I love her and it's why I love what Lauren made and has and there's so much of that in this show too is that it's like it's 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 a it's a turned up version of like what happens to people when they are hurt and I think that which is like also something I've always loved about Batman and you know I think that was like something we talked about on our first zoom um and yeah so I don't know if I just rambled too long but no um no. yeah that's so I I think it's two two part that that statement that sentiment. Well, yeah. And I mean, there's this phrase or this idea that I feel like has been coming up a lot in these first four episodes where someone tells somebody else, I want to help you. And I'm starting to get my hackles up. You know, I want to help you is now feeling like a threat. <laughs> and I mean, from the outside, Kristen, it feels like one of your biggest hurdles must be figuring out how to play somebody who has to keep her guard up, who has to keep other people feeling uneasy, who's pretty OK with getting a random street teenager killed. But you also have to make the audience empathize with why and empathize yeah. with you. I mean, that's also part of the, you know, the tragedy of her life, but also losing her brother. Like, you know, she goes from one. I, that's why I love that line so much of like, I'm not safe. I'm home. You know, she goes from like one prison into another one that like you could argue is worse because that's where it all went down. And that's like where the betrayal happened and where the gaslighting happened and where it's continuing to happen, where they're all just like, you know, hey, girl, <laughs> welcome back. Anyway, go in there. <laughs> Don't talk to her. You know, like it's it's crazy. It's crazy making. And um, yeah, 
it, it that is that does dictate how she moves and what she has to keep a lid on and like what's roiling inside her because she's just like having to continue to just swallow and um her one ally you know um is killed pretty much as soon as she's back home well yeah and i mean dealing with all of that betrayal it it does feel like it starts to mount up like for somebody yeah. like her who's really trying to seize whatever control she has i wonder you know when she was betrayed by Oz in, in the last episode before this, like I'm, I was thinking at that moment, I wonder what's worse for Sophia, getting betrayed yeah. by Oz again or knowing that she let him betray her again. I, I Yeah, I thought about that, too. I mean, I think it's the second one, <laughs> maybe <laughs> like. But, you know, uh, yeah, it's pretty brutal. Well, so Lauren, she gets her first start at the end of this episode. She gets a clean slate. It was bigger than I think a lot of us were expecting. Red wedding esque mm-hmm. is a word that I've been hearing get thrown around. I mean, Lauren, hell yeah, <laughs> <laughs> get them! <laughs> you did it, girl. Yeah, <laughs> you killed your family. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, but Lauren, that is a lot of characters just to kill to like take off the table for yourself to even play with. Yeah, halfway yeah. through the series. I mean, where did you sure get the is. nerve for that? It's bold so move? cool. It's so, <laughs> such a baller move. Um. I don't know. It was exciting to me, I, you know, because I wanted to change things up constantly on the show. I didn't want, you know, I didn't want you as much as possible to feel like we're doing the same old thing or, we're, you know, and th- to me, there's also so, only so much that Sophia would naturally be able to take. Having come from Arkham, having lived the life she has, all these people are so, you know, full of shit, honestly, th- to her. They treat her with such disrespect. And it's like, how much are you going to take that? And there's a part of her inside that is so much stronger and more powerful than them that she is letting simmer for a really long time. So character wise, it made sense to me to do that. And then it is like, okay, so if we do that, it's episode four, (laughs) where do we have to go? Because I do think that's a move that traditionally you might save for the very end of a season. Um, But that's really also what was exciting to me. I mean, I think it's kind of fun to write yourself into a corner a little bit sometimes and be like, how do we get out? And, and and because I felt Sophia should be doing that too. She's putting herself in a very tricky situation. So that was, it, again, it felt just in line with her character that she wouldn't be someone who waits. She's going to make a bold move and then have to deal with the repercussions and the consequences of that. Um, so it, it felt correct to do. And then, you know, obviously Johnny VD is still alive and we don't yet know uh, what's going to happen between the two of them. And so keeping a little bit of something there and what Sophia's intentions are, I think, are an interesting question to give the audience. Mm-hmm. I mean, do you have a beat in this episode, Lauren, that is your personal favorite for how Kristen played it? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> there we go. <laughs> oh, I didn't like anything she did. It was what a. It was just like dull, yeah. bad acting. Yeah. Uh, no. <laughs> Saved Obviously, by the edit. <laughs> not everyone understands my sense of humor, so just. Uh, that is the opposite of what I mean. Um, I don't know. I loved everything she did. I, I what I and I do mean that sincerely. The thing that I find so compelling in part about this is that I think I've told Kristen this before. I didn't anticipate when she was her younger version that she would have wilder hand gestures, that she would talk the way she talks. Like that to me was really stunning because I was like, oh God. Like what Kristen chose to do in all these different moments for her emotional arc, which by the way is extra difficult because we block shoot. So we shoot out of order um, and you really have to track that for yourself as an actor, what those emotional beats are that you're trying to hit. I was really floored and impressed by that because that she just did that. Um, And so I I felt then this youthful quality um, of someone who is a little bit more innocent and then what she goes through in Arkham and has to deal with there, and then how she comes out, how she's feeling all these con- conflicting feelings in her scene with Dr. Rush to then the end and what she does and how free she suddenly feels. Um, I, I mean, truly for me, uh, there's not a frame in this show that I'm not like so impressed by and that I didn't really love. And I've seen this <laughs> many times and I've sat <laughs> in editing for yeah. a really long yeah. time. Um, so yeah, it's honestly as dark and terrible as this episode is in so many ways. And it's so um, haunting what Sophia goes through. It's been a pleasure, honestly, too. <laughs> that's how I feel though, watch. too. It's, yeah. I was just doing an interview earlier today and they were like, wow, that's cr- like that episode is crazy. Like, was that hard? And I was like, 
no, I mean, like, sure, the hours are long or like you get thrown around a bunch and like maybe your like arm gets hurt or something. But like it's thrilling. It's a it's like I could do it forever because it's so thrilling. But I do want to ask, though, I mean, Kristen, are you scared of Sophia? No, 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 because I I mean, I'm obsessed with her. <laughs> like, I, like, I get it. I'm never like, oh, you know, obviously, like, I don't I'm not going around what she's doing, what she's doing. But like. <laughs> I just um, love her. I love her. And I love, you know, I think I understood everything that she did, which is also such a testament to Lauren. Like, yes, is she doing things that are, like, wrong? Of, of course. Like, should you, you know, murder <laughs> so many people? No, absolutely not. <laughs> but I, you can really see why this person does this and, like, why... Um, so sadly that like makes them feel free for the first time and that like that that's how they gain agency and that that's how they like find a new version of themselves when they've been so like I just I I loved it so she never scared me I, mean, I also had the time of my life too you know so like I I loved it all, all around we had the time of a lot of people's lives that ended really short <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well Thank you both so much, Kristen Lauren, for being here. Oh, thank you. Yeah, thanks for yeah. having us. This is a joy. For our next conversation, I'm going to hang on to Lauren and welcome Helen Shaver, who directed this episode. Hello, ladies. Welcome. Thank you for coming in. Good to be here. Hello. Well, so, Helen, in the spirit of origin stories, what's your origin story in coming to the Penguin? Why? Why are you here? What compelled you to join? Lauren, uh, we had worked together on Impulse. And uh, I don't know, that's a number of years ago. And I was just finishing New Look in Paris. I was very, very tired. I'd been there for six months. And my agent called and said, you got any interest in doing The Penguin in, in New York in the spring? And I didn't know. I hadn't seen The Batman at that point. I didn't know that Lauren was attached. I didn't know any of it. And I went, no, I, <laughs> is what I said. <laughs> and I, I'm tired. I, I, I want some time off. And uh, And then... I was uh, driving from Palm Springs to uh, Scottsdale with my husband after the G DGA Awards, about to do a, like a three-week road thing, and my phone exploded with agents and da-da-da-da, and I checked it out, and at that moment I found out that Lauren was the creator on this thing and that they needed a director to get on a plane. Well. They need me. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, can I do I some know. bragging it, on your behalf? I want to do yeah. some bragging on your behalf that you were leaving the DGA Award because you had just won an award for your work on Station Eleven. I want to make Thank sure you. I got it's that in there. A beautiful, beautiful show. I love that show. Overrated. It was very cool to do. And anyway, so I, I, I talked to Lauren, and she, I, she sent me the first five episodes. And that night, when we got to uh, Scottsdale. I sat down and read the first five episodes, and really, when I got to four and I finished reading four, I went, okay, all right, it's Lauren and this magnificent script, you know, and then the cherries on top are Colin and Kristen, and I am so in. And so instead of taking a three-week trip around North America with my husband, I uh, got on a plane, flew home, packed my bags, got up on another plane, flew to New York, and went to work. Glad I did. I mean, Lauren, Matt Reeves showed a little bit of Arkham at the end of The Batman, but he didn't show the woman's ward. So I'm really mm. curious, you know, let's start with you, Lauren. Like, tell me about your conversations with the art department about how you wanted to look. You know, what kind of imagery did you have your, in your head? Was there anything you knew you did not want to do that you felt like was just a mental hospital cliche to avoid? Well, you know, Matt established Arkham very very briefly at the end of his film between the Joker and the Riddler. So we saw a glimpse of Arkham. We saw the visitation room uh, and we saw the hallway and a little bit of a cell, but from a l mostly the outside, the yeah. exterior of it. Um, so that was established already in the film. And from there, we rebuilt that entire set to completely mirror uh, the film. So that was great, you know, to have that um, already conceived of. And then, you know, in terms of the mess hall, I mean, that was a deep collaboration with 
you know, Helen, of course, um, Jonathan Freeman, our cinematographer, Colleen Ivanoff, our production designer, um, you know, Deborah Wheatley, our supervising art director. Just like it was just as it always is in television, a, a real collaboration to try to figure out how can we make this grounded? How can we to what you just were saying, like not do something that you've seen time and again? You know, there's the easy comparisons, you know, of Orange is the New Black, for instance, just because I think it's mm. the most prominent pop culture show that exists that is in a prison, uh, you know, with in a women's ward. So we didn't want to do that either. But obviously, we also inherited the wardrobe from the film as well that the Riddler is established in. So it was really about trying to create our own mark and to sort of broaden that world. And that's sort of what we've been doing on the show in general anyway, in terms of Gotham City. Yes. And we, you know, the the thing that, so that creates the environment. But what's, what creates the reality? You know, what makes it real? And and the background makes it real. So all those women in there, I did as I always do, is I, I spoke to them, and I spoke to them about the fact that we all have a broken part inside of ourselves. We all have a wound. We all have a part, a place that if you press that button, we think we're going to go crazy, you know? And that I wanted them, that it, that we're going to represent mental illness and that we needed to honor it. And so I wasn't wanting them to act out, but rather to to act in, to go inside themselves, find their spot and and just be that in the in the imaginary circumstances. And you know, I'm really proud of all those women. <laughs> you know, Kristen is brilliant uh and and I love Kristen. She's she's just a joy, uh, really revelatory. I knew she was a great actor, and before I got there, but I was it was just the most delicious unwrapping and uncovering and and collaboration that we had on that piece. But it would have been nothing if there was a bunch of people acting like crazy people around her, right? I mean, it would have that would have been a nightmare. And uh, so it was it was it was joyful and. The, they those women sustained it for the two days, and at the end of it, they all <laughs> we we all went outside and took a big picture together, and they were all singing and jumping and re- really feeling like that they they had made a movie. That sounds yeah, so much did. happier than what I was picturing because, you know, my big question that I want to ask was that this episode has some really rough, some really deeply violating days for Sophia for for Kristen to embody as Sophia. So I was. Really yes. curious to hear about the mood on set those days from your perspective. Well, she and I, you know, talked about it before, but, but talk is talk, right? As a as a director, I, I, what I know both from when I was in front of the camera and now certainly when I was behind the behind the camera, that my job is to m- create the safe space where you're safe enough to fall on your face to make a mistake. To, uh, to not just use your intellect and do a safe performance, but rather, you know, do all the do all the thinking and preparing and do what, do whatever you do. But w- when you come to the moment, to be present and and take the ride, and um, and that there is something remarkable because because in order to do that, you have to trust, and I have to trust. And in any moment where two human beings trust each other, it is it is joyful in its own way, right? Uh, and yeah, it's painful what she's working with. It's hard to work the hours that we work. All of those things, but she was very, very willing, and I have to say, it was a joyful <laughs> bunch of work with all of its hardness, with all of its truth. Well, was it one of you that had the idea to? you know, kind of break the mood just a little bit after that really brutal montage of her first day at Arkham getting locked up to lighten the tension with that visual gag. You know, her her cell door slams shut, a loose screw hits the floor. That's that's a Helen Shaver move. I mean, obviously we (laughs) scripted, we scripted the whole, I'm trying to remember, and maybe we added that in because that's what you were thinking? I can't, I'm trying to remember. Originally in the script, it was as if there was Oh, it was as if it was made out of cinder blocks and that there was a way to see through the cinder blocks. But in fact, the set was not made that way. It was made with metal walls, right? And and I'm in there going, well, how the hell are they? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, but, then, but then I love the, because, you know, visually, we begin with a reflection. 
right? And the whole thing is a reflection and looking inward and looking backward. Uh, uh, um, and so the idea of looking through a small hole to another world really fascinates me, you know? I mean, it's like a keyhole. It's a, it's a, it's a way in. And what she sees on the other side of it, of course, is Maggie, who's out of her mind, but... <laughs> magpie. <laughs> or yeah. Magpie, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> right, uh, but I love that idea, though, that, that that idea came from working around something that was like, oh, no, this is not what I expected. And actually, Lauren, I want to hear a little bit more about Magpie, you know, Sophia's neighbor here in Arkham, because this is a character that people might know. So I'm curious, you know, to hear a little bit more about her, why you picked this character to be this person helping Sophia fit in at Arkham. Well, we wanted um, we wanted her to have sort of a strange friend or somebody next to her who could give voice to that experience. Um, that's really kind of where we were starting from in the writer's room. And then we did a lot of research, you know, for different characters that we could use. And we wanted to make sure there was a character that we use that wasn't going to be represented in the Batman that could really be our own and our own interpretation of it. And so, um, you know, John McCutcheon and and Dan Fuchs, who is our story researcher and script coordinator, you know, between the two of them, they looked up a bunch of characters and they found Magpie. And then, you know, we wanted to obviously always put our own spin on it. And so it became, this sounds strange maybe, but it became really important to me <laughs> that Magpie has a high-pitched voice. It was something we talked about in the writer's room, and she's written like a child. And so when we were casting Magpie, it was something that I didn't actually initially realize would be so essential. But at first, when we started to see casting tapes come in, no one was using this high-pitched voice for her, and it just didn't really spark the same way. Mm -hmm. And so then we went back to our casting directors, um, Cindy Tolan and Suzanne Ryan, who are amazing, and said, hey, I think we need to tell the actors who come in, we need you to have a childlike, very high-pitched voice. It's actually very essential for the character. And that really opened up the world for her um, and made her more specific and stranger uh, and we wanted her to have this childlike voice because we figured something happened to her in childhood. And, you know, our show does represent a lot of childhood trauma. And that's sort of what Sophia goes through, too. And it just felt very relevant. And to show that this this woman is not a good person. She's very violent. But she seems sweet because her voice is sweet. And, and also the specificity of that voice when Sophia just hears it and can barely see Magpie through that tiny little hole felt really important. Who is Magpie in the comics? Like, why did Dan think, oh, this is the right one? I mean, we really took her name more than anything and then created our own version of her. So, you know, there's Magpie and then um, there's Abby. Is this the girl who stabs herself in the neck with a fork? Yes. Um, what is going on with the girl who stabs herself in the neck with a fork? The girl who stabs herself in the neck with a fork has been there for a long time and she is desperate. She's she's she would rather die than be there another moment. And um, she's been sort of the puppet of uh, Dr. Ventress. Thank yeah. you. Well, and why do you think Sophia does the opposite? Why does she snap and kill Magpie? Um, you know, we talked a lot about why Sophia does what she does. And there's this recurring theme that happens throughout the episode that is her saying, I'm innocent. Mm -hmm. I'm innocent. And she says to Rush, I would never do anything like that. I would never kill women. I would never do anything like that. And yet she's in this broken place. She just comes off of seeing her brother who tells her that there is basically no hope left. Her fate is firmly sealed. She is going to be in Arkham for the rest of her life, potentially. And the tragedy of that and the anger and rage she feels for her father and sort of the impotence too puts her in this terrible state after being you know immensely tortured throughout um, you know the last six months and then here's magpie who honestly you know also part of the high-pitched voice was to have her be a little annoying and a little grating um, and obviously that's not an excuse um, but then it feels like to Sophia that magpie betrayed her yeah, and that betrayal. she's listening in and it's like how many betrayals can Sophia handle and there's this feral part of her that comes out in that moment and it, you know she's a mob daughter she's been around violence obviously shielded from it because she's a woman has a very different relationship with violence has never enacted violence literally herself 
but she's been around violence and she just kind of breaks and snaps in that moment and unfortunately becomes this thing that she was in denial of and said she would never become um, and still then in that moment, you know, says that she's innocent. I mean, how yeah, and okay, and it, it, it comes also on the tail end of of the series of uh, electroshock therapy. Therapy. They do use it for therapy. Yeah, but, you <laughs> yeah. know, so you our version of course with your fingers. Fingers. Uh, But where where she is, where where it's taken her to the point where she remembers this trauma, right? Where she ex- re experiences the trauma of finding her mother hanging there uh, as a little girl, which she had blocked. And and uh, which seals the whole betrayal of the father, and and so in a way, you know, and I think the only way traumas heal or or is to see them, right, is to revisit them on some level, and and so you have this incredible combination of of that truth realization, kind of healing, em- empowering that she was not crazy. And 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 that energy goes with the rage of betrayal, and, and her understanding that she's been betrayed, as she says when she wakes up with with Doctor Rush. You know, uh, uh, men have always told me, have always lied to me. You know, the doctors, the doctors, my father, now you. You know, um, she has to kill her <laughs> <laughs> at that moment to survive. I mean, in a in a kind of strange way. She is the sanest person in there, and and this act, if she is going to survive for the rest of her life in Arkham, right now she's just being batted around like a, I don't know, uh, a like tennis a ball, yeah, like yeah. a victim, and and she at that moment says, okay, no, all right. Boom, 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 boom. And to be fair, she doesn't have to do that, <laughs> and that's the thing with Sophia is she's very flawed and complicated and and is is dark and makes very violent choices and they're not okay and i think in that moment i think there is to what helen's saying a rationalization of you know i don't think she's feeling this in this exact moment but truly she becomes very powerful to the women around her and sort of embraces inadvertently this moniker of the hangman even though she is not the hangman and doesn't want to be that and that really helps her survive this terrible experience in Arkham because mm-hmm. she's in there 10 years. We're only showing you a glimpse of the first six months. So what she becomes beyond that um, you, is left to your imagination. But Sophia makes terrible, terrible choices. Like she's not a hero. <laughs> she's not a good person. You can justify around them, though, just like many of our other characters, too, and, and try to rationalize why she might do something. But you should be appalled because she doesn't need to do that. But she does do it. And probably because she does do that is why she survives a place like Arkham. I always saw her like if you think of a, a prism or a diamond with fat, many facets and that that can flip really quickly without what we would assume is a logical connection, right? That it's it's it, it, it a switch flips her to another face, which is fantastic. We, we've talked a lot about Sophia, but in this episode, we're also seeing a younger Oz in here, too. Mm. Tell me about him. Oz, who, once again, we see how much he wants to be on the inside, doesn't he? Poor guy. <laughs> poor guy. Well, uh, <laughs> Are you going to do air quotes for poor Uh-oh. guy, too? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, you know, first of all, again, testament to Mike Marino and his prosthetics team because they made a younger Oz. Um, and you really kind of feel that, you know, I think we are telling a rise to power story in a lot of ways. So even though this is Sophia's origin story, primarily you do get a sense of Oz, the fact that he's her driver, what that might feel like to be her driver. And I think in situations like that, because Sophia is quite privileged, you know, obviously, at least in the beginning when we first meet her. And I think in what happens often is the driver maybe knows more about you than you know about the driver in a situation mm-hmm. like that. And I I wanted to make sure we showed that Sophia is respectful of Oz and defends him in some ways. But at the end of the day, he's help to her. Mm-hmm. Um, and he feels that. And he aches for more. And he wants to be seen by her father as more than capable of doing something beyond being just a driver. Um and so here's an opportunity, you know, for Oz to get ahead 
and as he does in our show often like really skip some steps to do so because you know in his worldview the the world is unfair and how else is he going to get ahead he needs to make himself seen he needs to make himself important and he sees opportunity in providing information to Carmine in that moment and really being seen by him at the sacrifice of Sophia yes yeah one of the things we haven't mentioned in terms of all this development, because certainly the makeup and prosthetics and all of that are fantastic, and br- what Brian did with her hair, even you know, but is Helen, Helen Wang and her, oh, yeah. and her her the wardrobe? Because I mean, I I I think you could j- even with just Sophia's shoes, you could line them up chronologically and and watch this girl become this iconic woman (laughs) yeah no i mean helen is we've got two helens on this show (laughs) helen h helen s uh helen wong is like just she's so extraordinary what she does like just the most exceptional uh you know costume designer and i i pursued her because i saw station 11 Mm. and what she does in station 11 is incredible like she's so inventive and so creative and i loved how her mind works and she created this incredible mood board for our show that was so emotional and psychological which is always what we're looking for you know in anyone we bring on to the show we want them to engage in that not just what the exterior is but what's the interiority of a character and why someone is wearing that and sophia has quite a big transformation throughout our show and obviously we're only up through episode four but you start to feel the beginnings of that in this episode and so we were so specific and Helen was so specific with Kristen's wardrobe to really make sure you're feeling those shifts and changes in Sophia and obviously the yellow dress that appears at the end is so seminal. I love the yellow dress. I love sort of Jean Harlow gone wrong and and this outrageous color and and the flow of it and the nakedness of it and the I I I love all of that that that's where she comes to in in four. Well, Helen and Lauren, before we go, I want to ask you guys this: If a person tells you that this episode really disturbs them, does that make you smile? I I. I it is a very disturbing episode. Even even I, when I haven't seen it for a little while, and you know, we in the progression of the cuts and stuff, like it is so relentless. The pace is really demanding, and yeah. So I kind of uh, yes, I smile maybe not, but I'm grateful because that's what I wanted to do. Yeah, I feel similarly. I mean, I just laughed at that, but only <laughs> only because it's such a dark question from you, Amy. You, you've darkened. You're the darkest. Since you've You're the this. darkest. I felt like <laughs> no. I could throw it at you because I thought you might be cackling. Yes, I no, loved no. it. <laughs> but no, I I would. You know, you don't want what the pain is that Sophia goes through to. You don't want to feel pleasure in the in the idea of people watching something and being appalled by it. But I do think, you know, as storytellers, we do want people to feel things. Mm-hmm. And, you know, you make something with an effort to have it feel real and grounded and which I think is a very big challenge, you know, in Arkham State Hospital, traditionally in the comics, it's just a very big, broad comic book um, sort of idea of a mental institution. And Helen and Kristen and our entire team did such an exceptional job in grounding it. Mm -hmm. But you because it's so grounded, I, I hope and think you feel more because you can relate to what Kristen's going through. You can relate to Sophia Falcone in these moments. Um, And it is terrible and it is appalling. And it's always hard when you're putting a character through something like that. It has to serve a purpose to me. Otherwise, it's you're hurting somebody to hurt them. And that's just pointless to me. So we really tried to make an effort to have it feel like something terrible but you're with Kristen emotionally and she's selling it so beautifully on her face you're not actually seeing as much of course there's gore and we tried to pick our our moments but it has to feel relevant to the character's emotional journey and and I hope it does but even so it is it is a very very dark relentless episode but I and I I completely agree with you and I think what is gratuitous is to have violence emotional or physical violence that is not 
effective in terms of, you know, if you, to the audience, they should feel it. You know, I mean, if you're going to hit a woman across the face, there needs to be a bruise, right? You cannot, because I think that's where the gratuitous stuff happens is, is, is when, when, when violence happens and there's no effect, you know, and that you don't care about who's, who it's happening to or who's administering the violence. Because in a violent moment, both sides are, are whatever, wounded. You know, it, it is a two to tango kind of thing, right? Uh, and yeah, I mean, it, and I've held that for a long time. I mean, it, and, and in any project you go into, you know, I mean, when I've done Vikings, I've done uh, Westworld, I've done various things where there's violence. But, you know, if I don't care about the people in it, then I don't want to do it. Yeah. And also, you know, this is Sophia's story. So if there's violence enacted on Sophia, there there is you're seeing her through it. Whereas I think sometimes, too, for me, at least I've seen many things where there's violence against women for a man's story or for someone else's story. And it's used as a tool to further their journey instead of having it become rooted in who this part of who this woman is. This is not entirely who she is. And this is something she's combating throughout the rest of the show is her own identity. And, you know, is she more monstrous or is she human? And, and it's not that there is either, either one or the other. And so this is meant to really inform that and to give light to that and to showcase Sophia's perspective and moving forward, her perspective of a man like Oz, because that's really essential if you only have Oz's perspective of himself, then we all as an audience have a very distorted view of a, of a character like that. Also, I think that a, a, a very sort of universally shared thing with women is that oftentimes we feel unheard. Oftentimes we feel untrusted. Like, I mean, and, and, and certainly Sophia is a woman who is not heard until she makes herself heard. Well, Helen Lauren, this has been a marvelous conversation. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you. That was that was nice. <laughs> <laughs> This episode, we left back in time to understand Sophia's roots so that by the end of episode four, we'd better understand what drove her ruthless act of mass murder. Now we know the main players for the remainder of this series, whoever survived this episode. From here on, Oz's enemy list is smaller, but more like a distilled glass of poison. Bottoms up. Stream new episodes of The Penguin Sundays, 9 p.m. Eastern. Then come back to this podcast for an inside look at the making of. This was an OBB Sound production and hosted by me, Amy Nicholson. Executive producers for OBB Sound are Michael D. Ratner, Scott Ratner, Arlen Kanopaki, and Elias Tanner. Produced by Toby Lawless. Production manager is Brian Burgett. Engineered by Josh Falcon. Our editor and mixer is also Josh Falcon. Booking coordinator is Tess Bartholomew. Research producer is Jesse Holland. Executive producers for HBO are Becky Rowe and Savon Slater. Executives in charge of production for DC are Mike Pallotta and Victor Diaz. 